Hello. Supply side policies are, are one of the tools that governments use to try and achieve their macroeconomic objectives, along with fiscal and monetary policy, which are demand side policies. Supply side policies really are one of the main ways in which governments try and reach those objectives. And in this video, I want to go through uh, what a supply side policy is, how it affects um, the economy, uh, showing that through an ADAS diagram and also uh, looking at some of the possible policies that would be called supply-side policies that a government might actually employ. So let's start with the definition. Um, the definition of supply-side policies I put on the board. I'll just zoom in a little bit for you. There. So, any action by government that enables businesses to lower costs, thus boosting efficiency and competitiveness of firms. Successful policies shift the LRAS, that's the long run aggregate supply curve, outwards, raising potential output. So I'll leave that there for a moment. This is a definition of supply side policies. Now, you'll notice that I've put any action by government, and that's, 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 something, uh, that's something worth discussing because it, unlike fiscal policy, which is something quite specific, it's, it's the uh, it's the manipulation of government spending and taxation. And unlike monetary policy, which is also specific, it's about manipulating interest rates or the money supply, supply side policies really isn't something very specific. It could be any action by the government that enables businesses to lower their costs and increase their output and their efficiency and their productivity and their competitiveness. It's not one or two specific things. There are many, many possible actions by government that could be classified as supply-side policies. So let's go through three or four potential supply-side policies that a government might use. Let me rub out this definition now. So let's just go through two or three policies, or three or four policies, that could be classified as supply-side policies. And each of these policies, of course, can be evaluated. They, might, they are not perfect, they have potential weaknesses and problems associated with them, as do all policies. So firstly, um, what about increasing labour market flexibility? government acts to increase labour market flexibility, which could involve lowering the national minimum wage, weakening trade unions, and uh, reducing unemployment benefits. If the government took these kinds of actions, it is likely to reduce the average wage rate. Safety nets are being removed, um, and it is likely to, uh, safety nets are being removed in, in the labour market, and it's likely to force people to accept lower wages. Um, and this will have the effect of increasing the, uh, dem the quantity demanded of labour. Businesses will be more willing to create jobs and take on workers if they know that they can pay those workers lower wages. Um, other ways that the government can increase the labour market flexibility is if the government changes the laws regarding redundancy pay and the, the laws regarding hiring and firing of workers. If the government makes it easier to let workers go and cheaper to let workers go with lower redundancy pay rules, um, then businesses will be more willing to take on workers in the first place. Um, so these actions will increase labour market flexibility in that they encourage firms to create jobs in the workplace and take up uh, workers uh, because they know they can let them go easier when they need, more easily when they need to, and also that the labour costs will be lower. Now, of course, you're probably screaming at the camera already, uh, at the, at the uh, screen already, because there's a very, very obvious, powerful evaluation to this policy. And that is, of course, that these very um, mechanisms, like the national minimum wage and and trade union rights and unemployment benefits for people out of work and redundancy pay 
these are there to protect individuals from being exploited by businesses. Um, these are there to protect the most vulnerable of workers, the, the lowest skilled workers uh, who are receiving minimum wage from being, from being exploited by employers who would like to pay them even lower rates. Um, if, if workers cannot receive unemployment, if out of work workers cannot receive unemployment benefits, then they are certainly going to be uh, exploited because they're going to have to be taken on at very, very low wage rates. So I'm not suggesting that this is good or bad, I'm just pointing out that such an action of increasing labour market flexibility would increase the quantity demanded of labour and would create work, uh, but whether that's worth uh, that's a worthwhile price to pay, given the, the increasing inequity, the, the lack of fairness for, for low-skilled workers that would result. Nevertheless, that would be a supply-side policy shifting the LRAS curve to the right, and we'll show that on a diagram a little later in this video. Let's have a look at another, another uh, possible supply-side policy. Another possible supply-side policy would be now, a second supply-side policy that governments can do is to invest in education. Invest in education and improve the quality of future labour. If the government is prepared to put money into education and improve the quality of kindergartens and primary schools and secondary schools and universities, it's likely that the future generation of, uh, of workers who pass through that improved education system will be of higher quality. They will emerge from education and go into the workplace as a more productive uh, unit of labour uh, ready to be able to absorb and take on and develop more skills in the workplace. Um, so, given that to achieve economic growth, the government has to uh, improve the quality and the quantity of the limited factors of production. Here we are improving the quality of one of those factors of production, labour. The problem arises because uh, there are so many ways to invest in education. Should they build more kindergartens, or more schools, or more universities? Or should they invest in the capital of existing educational institutions, that is improving the, the level of technology, uh, computers and interactive software, uh, and so on, in, in, in the uh, available in schools? Um, or should they focus on teachers? Should they provide more teachers so the class sizes are smaller? and pupils and students get more attention from, those, from teachers? Or should they raise the pay of existing teachers to encourage more people to go into teaching and the quality of teaching would therefore improve? There are so many possible ways of doing this. Of course, another major problem with improving education to improve quality of future labour is the time lag. Not many governments are prepared to outlay a large expense right now with big opportunity costs. Where's the money going to come from? Healthcare, defence. Not many governments are prepared, not many politicians are prepared to, to make that serious investment uh, given that the results don't show themselves for quite some time. Um, Short-term costs for very long-term gains is not something that politicians uh, like very much. So that is a potential, though, second uh, supply-side policy. And we'll look at what that does uh, to aggregate supply in a diagram in just a moment. But a third supply-side policy, potential supply-side policy that governments could use to boost the productive capacity of the economy, a third supply-side policy would be to invest, invest in the infrastructure of the country, specifically roads. Governments can spend a lot of money improving the quality of roads, widening busy roads and building new roads, but not just roads. They may also want to invest in tunnels, bridges and rail networks and uh, ports, seaports, airports. If the government can improve the efficiency of transportation, 
then the government is definitely going to be implementing a successful supply side policy. But let's focus on roads. If the government is prepared to invest in roads even more, widening and existing roads, improving the road surfaces, and also um, improving the number, increasing the number of roads where they are needed, um, then they are helping businesses reduce their costs in two ways. Firstly, transportation will be quicker. And if transportation is quicker, that reduces costs. It reduces costs uh, for uh, the cost of driving, it reduces the cost in terms of how much petrol is, uh, or gas is burnt um, during transportation. But secondly, if they improve the quality of roads, they will also reduce the rate at which companies' transportation vehicles depreciate. If on existing roads a lorry will last 10 years, with all the bumps and the damage it gets done, the wear and tear, it depreciates over 10 years. And the cost of that lorry for the firm has to be spread over 10 years. But if, with better roads, uh, the lorry lasts for 20 years, then that uh, obviously saves businesses a lot of money because their, 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 their capital, their lorry, is depreciating at a slower rate. So, so governments prepared to invest in road building programs are in fact implementing a supply side policy, reducing transportation costs and protecting the value of, of expensive capital uh, for, for businesses. However, again, we can criticise this policy. This policy can easily be criticised because road building is incredibly expensive very, very expensive. It's also deeply unpopular because it, it creates problems while the road is being built, of course. Congestion problems are worsened uh, and also pollution problems, noise pollution, air pollution. But also, um, there's an environmental impact. If we build more roads or widen existing roads, then it raises issues regarding the environment. Um, and it was, also, it's a very slow process. So, uh, again, this, this is a, a potential supply side policy with some serious possible uh, problems associated to it. One more supply side policy it is um, a popular one that people often quote in essays that they're writing about supply side policies is uh, giving subsidies, grants and soft loans to businesses. Soft loans are cheap loans. Um, giving money to businesses to help the businesses uh, reduce their costs of production. Maybe it will be tied into doing certain investment, maybe it will be tied into uh, to training workers, whatever, but giving, basically giving money to businesses. Uh, I think this is uh, very easily criticised um, in two ways. Firstly, an obvious way, it can be very expensive. Although you can evaluate the evaluation, if you like, uh, by saying, yes, it might be expensive in the short run, but if the business is successful because of the subsidy it got, then it will pay back the government in future tax payments uh, many times over. Okay, maybe, fair enough. But here's another thing to consider as a criticism of governments giving out subsidies and grants. If a business has a good idea, if a business's idea is good enough, it shouldn't need the government money. It should be able to convince a bank manager uh, to lend them the money if the business idea is good enough. And if it isn't good enough, not good enough such that a bank manager wouldn't lend the money, then why should government give the money? After all, government, government giving of grants is actually taxpayers' money. So uh, taxpayers wouldn't thank the government for giving out a subsidy to a business which had been refused a bank loan, presumably. Who are the government to judge whether a business should or shouldn't be given a grant? Clearly everyone who knocks on the government's door shouldn't be given a grant or a subsidy. There has to be some, some method of filtering uh, between a good idea and a bad idea, but that's what a bank manager would do. And if a bank manager won't lend the money, then why should the government give the money? So I think it's, it's easy to criticise the giving out of subsidies uh, and, and grants um, from government to businesses. I'm not convinced that this is a very effective supply-side policy. I've just gone through four supply-side policies. I'm sure there are 404 possible actions by government that would increase the productive potential of the economy. But let's close this video uh, lesson by looking at what happens in the economy, by looking at an ADAS diagram and trying to show the benefits of successful supply-side policies. So let me remove this and put on there an AD. AS diagram where we have price level on the vertical axis and we have output on the horizontal axis. And I'm going to draw it this way. I'm going to put a Keynesian LRAS there and I have 
going to have AD here. Right, here we are at equilibrium. Currently the price level is P1. We're at producing very close to the full employment level of YF. We're producing at Y1. The economy is close to full employment. Okay, um, I'm just going to adjust the angle of the camera slightly so that you uh, can see that. Successful supply side policies will shift the LRAS curve outwards to LRAS2. Now you can see that the potential output of the economy has increased to YF2 and we've gone from point A to point B. The effect of those successful supply side policies has been to reduce the price level downwards as we've gone from A to B, so we've been able to tackle any inflation we have, and it's not deflation because probably the AD curve is rising anyway, but I'm assuming that the AD curve is static, which is a bit unrealistic. But in, you can see that ceteris paribus, an output shift of the LRAS, helps tackle rising prices. Um, it also increases output from, YF, uh, from Y1, close to the full employment of YF, to a new potential of YF2. Um, we're close to that now. That's created jobs as well, and the lowering of Costs has helped increase the competitiveness and it will probably boost exports as well. So there are many benefits to increasing the LRAS with successful supply side policies. Of course some Keynesians would argue that in a deep recession, if AD was back here and we were producing Y1, then boosting the potential output would be of no use and what we should be focusing on is boosting AD outwards. Uh, if you're stuck back here, uh, then there's little point in boosting the potential, which was not, we were nowhere near the potential, to an even bigger potential. No, expansionary demand side policies would be called for instead. But given that supply side economists or monetarists assume we're always close to full employment, um, then that's, you can see therefore, from their point of view, the benefits of boosting LRAS. Increases potential output, output and actual output, tackles inflation and will create jobs as well. So um, hopefully that's shown you something about the, the effects of, uh, of, 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 of successful supply side policies. Any action at all by government uh, that, would, that would help improve the efficiency of businesses. I went through four supply side policies. Other ones might be things like reducing government bureaucracy or um, so that, so that businesses can get on with business more quickly, relaxing uh, health and safety laws, relaxing environmental laws that businesses have to adhere to, um, would also be, and even cutting tax rates. Although cutting tax rates sounds like a fiscal policy, cutting tax rates is also, of course, a supply side policy because it boosts motivation. It encourages people that were outside the workforce to enter the workforce because they'll be able to keep more of their pay. It encourages business to, businesses to invest knowing that perhaps they'll be able to keep more of their profit, they won't lose it on tax. So cutting tax is also a very important supply side policy. All right, well, I, I hope that makes some sense, and uh, just reaching for the remote controller. And uh, thanks very much for listening. Bye-bye.